I think we'll keep moving along here. Our next speaker is uh, Travis Laverry. He's gonna be presenting on the COVID impacts on black-footed ferret research. Travis is a wildlife biology biologist who's worked with black-footed ferrets, prairie dogs, and plague in South Dakota for 25 years. He works for small nonprofit prairie wildlife research and is finishing up his PhD at Colorado State University with research focused on the effects of plagues on black-footed ferret populations. So Travis, the floor is yours. Great. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Christy, for introducing black-footed ferrets and a lot of the biology that I don't need to go through. Um, we can get right into black-footed ferrets and SARS, COVID, and whatever else we want to call it. Um, so I am going to start out with some terminology and definitions so that we're all speaking the same language. And then I'm going to quickly review how SARS-CoV-2 infects mammals, um, who we know are susceptible mammals, and then the, de the decision process that we went through for why and how we would go forward with doing field work with Blackfoot ferrets with um, coronavirus. And then some ideas for some suggested practices if you're working with wildlife and some things that you might consider. So first let's start out with just some terminology and definitions and we all use these interchangeably and, and that's okay. But I also wanna make sure that we all understand that they are somewhat different in some ways. So coronavirus is the family of viruses that affects both birds and mammals. That includes the original coronavirus, the original SARS, SARS-CoV-1, which was circulating in Asia back in 2002, 2003. Um, also includes MERS, M-E-R-S, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that struck South Korea in 2015. Those are also coronaviruses. Um, they're called coronaviruses because they have spikes on them, like a crown or a corona, and that would be the Latin term for it. Um, so that's where the coronavirus, that's what the, where it's, its uh, name origin is. It's different than a flu. Flu uh, viruses are in the orthomyxidae viridae family. Colds are in the rhinovirus. So it's a different thing than a, than a flu or a cold. The virus that we call the novel coronavirus is SARS-CoV-2. So the severe acute respiratory syndrome 2, and it's part of the coronavirus family it causes the disease called coronavirus disease 2019, where we get COVID-19. So COVID-19 is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus within the coronavirus family. But again, we all use this interchangeably and that that's okay. And I just wanna make sure that we understand the different etymology here. So this is something that is still a little bit under investigation. How did SARS-CoV-2 emerge? We know that it came from bats and bats are the natural reservoir host. Um, they are generally unaffected by the virus and they've come to a kind of an evolutionary balance that the virus is able to maintain itself within bats without generally harming them. Um, but then when bats shed that virus in their feces, that's when we get into trouble. And so in this case, we think it got into pangolins in the wet markets in Wuhan, China, and that's the intermediate host where then that virus then changed, replicated and came back out and became this novel coronavirus that then hits the novel host humans. And um, that's what we think at least is the pathway of how SARS-CoV-2 got to us just a little bit about how it infects mammals. Those spike proteins that are on that, that virus interface with the ACE2 receptors. The ACE2, uh, it's angiotensin converting enzyme two. That's a, an enzyme that is found within um, our bodies, mostly in our organs, like our lungs and our arteries and our hearts and kidney. Um, and it regulates blood pressure and salt balance. And so that's kind of the, the gateway for SARS-CoV-2 virus to get into our cells. And we have a lot of these ACE2 receptors in our respiratory system, our upper tract down into our lungs. So 
And again, it affects blood pressure and things like that. So think about how that relates to us as humans and how um, SARS-CoV-2 has been affecting us. So that spike protein then gets right up in that ACE2 receptor. And then it, it, that allows that RNA molecule to be pushed into the cell, which then takes over the machinery of that cell and starts replicating. And that's how we get infected. So here's just some, a little bit of who we know as far as mammals are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Um, you notice that these lists are kind of short. That's because we don't know a lot about um, susceptibilities. And I tried to include kind of some South Dakota mammals in here and some Great Plains mammals, um, just for some reference for folks. When I say susceptible, that means that the virus it can, can infect the animal and replicate within the animal. Um, it doesn't mean that they necessarily develop disease or they transmit it, but they're susceptible to infection. And so, for instance, we know that bats are susceptible to infection and they can shed that virus. Um, mink and ferrets, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about mink here pretty quick, are susceptible. Um, we heard of some cases in zoos with lions and tigers, mountain lions. We know that the uh, great apes are very affected by it, some rodent species and some skunks. And then we've got some lab trials recently that have shown that animals like rabbits and prairie dogs and house mice cannot be infected by it, um, at least under lab conditions. And I think we need to be vigilant about what can be infected and how it can be affected um, and maybe how that might even change with different variants of SARS-CoV-2. So you may have heard that mink are probably the most susceptible animal that we've documented so far as far as SARS-CoV-2. They can be infected, they shed virus and develop disease. And you may have heard about mink farms um, in Europe and here in North America in uh, Wisconsin and Utah that had high mortality of mink. Um, so not just do they get it, they die of it. They think it was passed from the workers at the mink farm to the mink, who are usually kept in close quarters. Um, there is some question as to whether it could have been passed back to humans, which would be really bad because then that could actually be a, a different variant possibly. And then there's even been documentation of a few cases in the wild mink near some of these farms. Um, I know at least one case in Utah. So this is a, a, a pretty bad thing for mink. And you guys know probably that black-footed ferrets are related to mink. They're within the, the mustelid family. And so um, are black-footed ferrets susceptible? As Christy and Randy detailed, we do a lot of intensive work in the field of black-footed ferrets. And if we're gonna continue that field work, we have to understand this question. So based on domestic ferrets and their susceptibility, it's very likely that black-footed ferrets are susceptible. We don't know for sure. We don't know of any infected uh, individuals, but we, we can guess that they probably likely are. We know that domestic ferrets can become infected, that virus will replicate within them, uh, can be shed and can be transmitted within domestic ferrets. Typically it's restricted to just the upper respiratory tract and doesn't get very deep into the lungs. And so we have not heard about a lot of mortality with domestic ferrets. Um, domestic ferrets, are farmed as well in North America for medical research, as well as for the pet trade. Um, and I've talked to a lot of pet ferret vets that also have suspected a few ferrets with COVID-19, but have not had any die that they know of because of COVID-19. So based upon that, we keep asking this, should we continue working with black footed ferrets in the field? And um, Christy detailed a little bit of this, but in the field, uh, when we're trying to figure out the size of these populations and vaccinate them against plague, that typically occurs in the, the late summer fall timeframe and consists of um, spotlighting, trapping these guys, taking them back to a little mobile trailer out in the prairie, knocking them out and putting a microchip and getting them vaccinated. So a, a pretty hands-on experience for black-footed ferrets. So given that humans are this novel host and black-footed ferrets are susceptible. Again, should we continue working with black-footed ferrets? Is it worth the risk 
for us uh, possibly to transmit this virus to Blackfoot ferrets. Um, a couple of things that we considered was that, first of all, is that Blackfooted ferrets are a solitary animal. So the likelihood of transmitting um, between ferrets is pretty low. So if a human were to transmit it to say this individual Blackfooted ferret in this trap, the probability of it then going to other ferrets through that ferret would be pretty low. We know as Christy and Randy just talked about the risk of plague in Blackfooted ferrets is pretty high and is very fatal. So we were weighing the risk of plague versus the risk of COVID-2. And we then used options, some planning and protocols to continue our field work. And, our, and we decided that, yes, we probably think that we can do this safely and effectively. And we went forward. Um, we had weekly conference calls amongst all of our partners on, on how to do this. The strategy that we came up with basically came down to managing people. Um, we, we are the hosts, and if we can manage um, how we interact with SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, that would probably mitigate some of the threat with black-footed ferrets. We already have a, a pretty good PPE protocol because of disease concerns, but we enhanced it even more um, for, for this situation. And then we went to a, a, a higher disinfection rate of our equipment as well. Um, so just to give you some ideas of what that, that looked like for us, um, many of you on this, and I'm great, great to see so many people that I know that have been uh, out in the field with us and worked with us over the years, know that we like to have people come out and work with us in the field, whether it be students or other biologists or, or even sometimes members of the public. Well, if we're going to manage the people and the hosts, we needed to get down to the essential crew only. So it was all just a handful of people that typically live in the area and, and aren't traveling in. Um, and so no passengers, no observers, one person per pickup truck. We minimize our travel. So fewer trips to town, stay longer in the field in terms of, you know, for, I live in Colorado. So when I go to South Dakota, I would stay there for at least three weeks at a time. We would minimize our public contact. Um, we would use grocery pickup at, in Rapid City to get our groceries. We wouldn't go in the store. When we, wanted, when we wanted to gas up our pickup trucks, we would go after hours when the gas station was closed and nobody was around. Because if you want to go to Wall, South Dakota at, in August to gas up, there's going to be a lot of people around. Um, so again, try to minimize that contact with people. We also were fortunate enough that we have a remote field camp to live in. So at this field camp, we have our travel trailers. That's where we, we live when we're on site and it, we can go right to the field from there. And we are a mile and a half from any human being, um, when we're in our field camp. I'll, I'm sure as many of you do when, when you're out in the field and you got a crew of people together you like to gather around the tailgate of the pickup truck and kind of talk and uh, talk about what you're going to do for the day or the evening or whatnot and maybe an after action type of a thing we had to really rethink that and say you know what we should not be um communicating face to face we need to communicate by text by phone by two-way radio um, when, when I assign somebody to spotlight in an area and work that area, they're going to stay in that area. They're not going to shift from night to night to night um, and have different people coming through. Um, and then we also used temperature checks each evening before you go out in the field. You would do a non-contact thermometer check to, and then check in with, with folks and say, I, my temperature was 97.9 and I'm feeling fine and things like that. And so... Um, this was a, a, a good protocol for us. Um, one of the great little apps that the Forest Service has made good use of is the uh, Avenza app, a mapping app, if you haven't used it. And they put their prairie dog colonies up on that map. And if you look at that right um, screenshot from my phone, I was able to then go into the app, circle the prairie dog county that I wanted to assign somebody to go work that night, text it to them and they could go there. And so again, we didn't have to even uh, have a paper map that we handed off in person. We could just do it um, digitally. 
And then when we're not on site, so when I, for instance, when I would come back home to Colorado for the weekend or whatnot, um, I would go get a PCR test and make sure that I was not infected with plague. And then before I went back in the field, try to get a test. So um, as regularly as possible, we would try to get a PCR test for COVID-19. As I mentioned, we already had a bit of a PPE protocol for disease, um, but we try to enhance it even more in this case. Whenever we were annual round black foot appearance, generally we wear masks to begin with when we're doing anesthesia and things like that. But even when we get out of the pickup truck um, to go set a trap and that kind of thing, we would wear masks. Um, if ferrets were anywhere near us, we wore masks. Before you even got out of the pickup truck, you'd sanitize your hands. Um, all of the anesthesia for black-footed ferrets came through just one person, through me. Um, so we minimized the amount of people that would be handling black-footed ferrets. And then any surface that was touched by a ferret or a human, we sanitized with accelerated hydrogen peroxide. That's the, from talking to a lot of veterinarians and other folks, that is the um, best product for killing coronavirus. Um, and this particular product, Rescue, is a veterinary product that was pretty well available for us. Um, and we were able to get, I was able to buy it at the hardware store and wall, as a matter of fact. Um, and so you could put it into spray bottles, you can, they can buy it in wipes. Um, excellent product for, for wiping down things and, and sanitizing those surfaces. So each, so we would try to segregate our Blackfoot ferret traps in the back of the pickup truck. Um, on the left there, you can see that wooden divider um, on the one side are clean traps that haven't been used that night. And the other side are dirty traps that were used. Um, in the morning then we would sanitize those traps and leave them out in the sun um, to kill any virus particles that might be on that trap that came from either us handling that trap or, or possibly even the black footed ferrets themselves. Travis, you got about three minutes left. Okay. Was this successful? Well, we did not have any crew members that came down with coronavirus that we know of. Um, we observed individual black-footed ferrets over a period of multiple months. So um, we know that they, they lived at least a few months. We handled 196 black-footed ferrets and documented a total of 210 in Kanata Basin Badlands National Park. And um, that bottom graph is the active coronavirus cases in Pennington County. That green area was our field work um, so we were working through the, the, the rise of coronavirus um, in Western South Dakota. So looking to 2021, we're going to get vaccinated, um, but we're also going to maintain vigilance and we're going to keep looking uh, at that circulation in humans. Is it going to mutate? And is, are there any other wildlife species that this might get into, like mink or something like that, that could maintain it in the environment? So we're going to keep up on the literature and the science. Uh, we're going to continue this enhanced PPE and disinfectant. Uh, you may have heard that there's also a vaccine for captive animals. Um, that's probably not something we'll use in the wild, but for the captive animals and for the zoo animals, that's a really good thing. So for folks here, if you're working with mustelids or canids or felids or bats, you might consider some different things um, in terms of uh, SARS-CoV-2. You might consider just not even working directly with the animal if you don't have to. You might look at enhanced PPE protocols. You probably should review whatever animal handling protocols you have and maybe even get some outside eyes on that review um, to see if there's some, some ways you can improve that. Look to improve your equipment and tools and your situational environment to minimize that risk. Uh, and manage your people, ensure that their personnel remain healthy and they get tested on a regular basis. As I mentioned, we still don't know a lot about who, what mammals are susceptible. And as we might have these different strains going around, that could change. So report any mortalities to CDC and your state veterinarian and just keep vigilant on this. I, I don't think that we're just going to be over this, unfortunately, um, anytime soon. And when I use the word we in this talk today, this was the U.S. Forest Service, Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and a lot of other folks. And so we work as a great team together in the Kanata Basin Badlands. Any questions? 
I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, anyone just want to unmute and ask any questions you might have for Travis? I'll just say this is Christy Bly with World Wildlife Farm. That this is a remarkable feat to pull off. Uh, you know, Travis ha handles more ferrets than anybody in all of North America every year. And so kudos to you, Travis, for doing it so well and so safely and creating a model for the rest of us to use. It's a good partnership with a lot of people. Yeah, I would second that. I had the opportunity a long time ago to help Travis in the field and it was an incredible experience. So it's great that you've been finding ways to still continue doing this while keeping the animals safe. And Anything else for Travis? Doesn't sound like it. Thanks again, Travis, for coming to present to us and taking the time. Sure appreciate it. Um, we are scheduled now for a break. Um, we'll come back, starting a little late, but we'll come back again at 3.20 um, to start our next presentation. <laughs>